it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind it either heard me or smelt me and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up and that that shocked me they don't make people that that big the way it moved uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. My name is Pam, a.k.a. Purple Rose, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking to James. And James comes to us from Pennsylvania. He had a pretty terrifying encounter when he was young. James and a friend of his started yelling at what they thought was a bear. But it ended up being one of these creatures. And the creature came down to confront them. And then we're also going to be talking to Kathy Strain. And Kathy's actually part of the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, uh, and she's been down to Area X. I know I had Matt Pruitt on. He talked about Area X. Kathy's going to be sharing her own encounters from that area. And Kathy's actually a West Coast uh, investigator. She studies the role of Sasquatch in Native American cultures. She holds a master's degree in anthropology from California State. She's also worked as an archaeologist. She published a book back in 2008, The book is called Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, Bigfoot in Native Culture. Uh, If you get a chance, check it out. It's on Amazon, and I'll throw a link in below. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome James to the show. James, thanks for coming on. Um, you're welcome, Wes. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And I know you had quite the encounter uh, when you were younger in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you would, just kind of take us back to that moment. Kind of tell us what you were doing and and what happened. Okay, well, um, every summer, uh, my family would have a family reunion. And we'd go to our, my grandparents' house who lived in Pennsylvania. So we'd go there every year. The kids would stay out in tents and the adults would stay in the house and we'd kind of make it like a camping event. It, they lived in a suburb of, of, it wasn't quite a town, but it wasn't quite a, uh, in the country. It was kind of like a borough, if, if that makes sense. Over the course of a couple of years is sleeping in those tents. Um, every now and then my cousins would elbow me and say, Hey, do you hear that? And I would say, what are you talking about? And in the distance, we could hear a howl. We asked our, the grown-ups about it, and they just kind of played it off like, well, you're hearing a fire siren or, you know, you're just hearing an animal or something like that. They just played it down. So so eventually we came back to Virginia, and my parents got transferred to Pennsylvania, southwestern Pennsylvania. We uh, got a house in the next county over, which is Greene County. I was in high school at the time. And I met some friends, and I met this one guy in particular, and I'm going to call him Billy because I'm not sure that he would want his name out there. So me and Billy 
become really good friends and we uh, uh got to hanging around we rode bikes a lot because that's how we got around there because it, it was a rural area so if you didn't have a bike you, you walked so we spent a lot of time riding bikes and stuff like that and he he says hey man do you like to fish and i said yeah i really like to fish a lot so we uh he says i've got a spot here that we can go to is there, there's a creek um he says it's about a half a mile mile up the road he says and i go there all the time he says because i get bored i said okay we'll do that so we go up to the the service road it's a dnr road like a fire road for the dnr in case there was a fire back there or something we we would go there and we'd go up to a, a train trussle and we'd walk across the trussle to the other side and we'd fish and we did this for a couple of weeks or so it was frequented by a lot of people because they'd leave their their beer cans and use cigarette butts all over the place so we knew people were frequently at that area so you know we didn't think nothing of it and we like i said we did that for about like two or three weeks and so we wanted to find out what was further across from the trussel so we we started hiking and going deeper into the into the woods and as we went deeper into the woods it got thicker and it, you could tell people wasn't back there much and the only trails that we could go down to get to the water was like deer trails so we kept on and we did this for about another week we just hiked around to look to see what was back there we come across this spot that uh there was a, like a deer path that went down to the water because the the road was up on a ridge it was a dirt road or a gravel road and up on that ridge you, you you could overlook it if you got close enough to it but there was trees lining it so you really couldn't see over there unless you really got to the edge and so we found a spot in that deer trail where the water was really shallow you could walk across it so we walked across that and we went over to the other side which was really pretty clear over there you know we didn't have a bunch of overhang or growth growth of brush or anything like that so it was um and the dirt was really soft it was moss covered it was shaded area because the tree overhang so we found a spot there um that was about 20 feet wide and about 10 feet off the edge of the tree line so we um we thought hey this would be a great place to camp and he says well let's let's plan on camping here one one weekend or, or something so we went ahead and did that we planned on that so we like i said we had to ride bikes in there so we could take just bare necessities. We had a basket or and stuff like that, and a duffel bag that we carried. You know, a little bit of food and our fishing poles and um, an old canvas tent that we had and that we scrounged up from our parents. And you know, we just was going to make a weekend of it and just have have a you know just a good time. Boys being boys, I guess. We we get up to this place and the wildlife flourished up there. It was nothing to see deer's. It, it, rabbits and squirrels it was really active with wildlife apparently nobody went back in that area because of the growth and stuff and like i said the dnr really used that road to travel back and forth on so we went ahead and did it we set up camp and the, the first day was fantastic we were having a blast because the water was deep enough that we could swim too so like i said everything went, went was going well we were we were just um having a blast so over the course of the day as it was getting later we noticed pebbles coming from the top of the road down the ridge and they were just dropping in the water like you know somebody was walking up top and that was kind of pretty impossible because we were way out there so that, that kind of got of our, our attention but we really didn't pay no attention to it because uh, black bears are really common there so we thought it was a bear, so we started beginning to yell at it, you know, go away, bear, go away, and just to let it know we were there. Because a lot of times, if you're in the woods and you come across a bear, and it's, or if you think you're around a bear, if you make noise, it'll go away. Um, but it, it stopped, but then it started again. So we thought that was kind of odd, but we, it was up top, and we were down at the bottom, so we really didn't worry about it. It started to get kind of like dark, and we noticed like rocks being thrown into the woods and that really got our attention because that was really weird <laughs> and this was a time when we didn't have internet we we never heard of this and most of the stories we heard was either word of mouth or or from a television program like in search of or um mysterious monsters or something like that 
and I think I did at that time. I, I had seen the uh, Legend of Boggy Creek. So you know, but when you've seen it on TV, you look at it. Well, you know, that's not around here, so we don't worry about that. We went ahead and we ate something, and it was getting dark, and and we went ahead and called it a night. And while while we were sleeping, sometime during the night, we started to notice something moving around our camp. It didn't come really close to the tent, but you could hear it around us. And um, and it just sounded like something was walking. So we thought, oh, here's the bear. Now we're, you know, we're going to have to deal with this issue. So we just started making noise, a little bit of noise, and we could hear it go off into the woods. So we just dealt with that. We thought, okay, that's, that's probably that bear. Well, when we got up in the morning, uh, the fire pit had been, it looked like something walked through it and kicked it. It was just the rocks were all gone that we had dug out and put it, the rocks around. They were, it was just messed up. And our fishing poles were scattered all over the place. And we, I, we just thought that that bear had just nosed through the stuff. And we were convinced it was a bear. The next day it got, it was different. We got more rock throwing. And we thought we, we thought people were messing with us. So we got loud. We started hollering and, you know, we were saying, you know, we're going to kick your butt if, if we have to come up there and, you know, and then it just kind of, kind of stopped, but you could still tell something was pacing up top of that hill. It was going back and forth, back and forth. And we started hearing a huffing noise, like, like, hoo, hoo. we hear that every couple, you know, minutes or so, and then it would stop. And th then we started to get a little concerned. Like, What's going on here? And sometime during that night, too, we were woke up to what we thought was a tree breaking or, or a knock in sound, like somebody was hitting wood with together. Neither one of us knew what a wood knock was because, like, there was nothing to reference that. We just kept on, and, and it started to get about 5 o'clock or so in the evening. And all of a sudden, it sounded like something was coming through there, like a tank coming down through the hill. And this thing stepped out, and it turned toward us and growled. And if the motion was so fluent, it didn't turn with its neck or anything. It, it barely had a neck or any neck at all. But the whole thing just turned and stared at us and growled this really low, you really made me mad kind of growl. And <laughs> we just, we lost it. We lost all control of bodily function. We were only about 20 yards away from this thing. We were close to this thing. And if it wanted us, it had us. It had us. We wouldn't have had no chance. And we kind of hung our heads down. And when we broke eye contact with it, it walked off. And before it, while it was growling, the, the funny thing, I, I keep saying that I noticed the mouth because the mouth was just, it was wide. It had a very wide mouth and a narrow lip that when it growled, it was like it was purposely showing us its teeth. And we, we were stunned there for, we just, he looked at me and says, let's get the F out of here. I can't deal with this. And we took off. We ran, all, we left our bikes, we left everything. We just started running. And we got, I got to my parents' house. We got to my parents' house. And my parents knew something was wrong. They could see it in our face. They could see, and, and they said, "What?" They asked both of us, "What's the matter?" And I said, "I don't want to talk about it. I just don't want to talk about it." And it took a little bit of coaxing for them to get it out of us, because me and him, we didn't even talk about it when we were running. We were just, we were trying to get out of there. And the eyes on this thing was just, it was just, they were black eyes. It didn't even look like it had a soul. It just looked. Like it was looking right through us and it was like it was telling us, okay, make a move. This thing was crazy big. And so my parents said, okay, we need to call somebody about this because you've seen something out there and you, there's something wrong here. We done peed all over ourselves and everything. We, like I said, we lost total body control. We, we couldn't stop shaking. We, we were terrified. We were up. My parents said we were white as ghost. And so my parents called the DNR, the local DNR. And, uh, and 
they said that uh, we, we'll send an officer out. Well, the next day he came down there and he wanted to take, he wanted us to go up there and show him where it was at. And, and we were reluctant to go up there. We didn't want to go. We, we were, we, we were at the point of tears too. We did not, we begged him not to make us go up there. And my parents says, well, look, we'll go with you and we'll go up there. So we all went up there and, and I just didn't want to go down to that spot. We stayed up on top of the, the ridge while they were down there. We, we stayed in the car. And uh, so eventually they wanted to, t the DNR guy wanted to talk to us to see exactly what we seen. And I took them to where it walked out of the water and there was prints there. So he says, oh, look at this. He says, we got some bear tracks. Wes, those were not bear tracks. They look like human feet. So he says, well, I'm going to go ahead and take a cast of these. And he casted them. And my parents said, well, if it's bear tracks, why are you casting them? My parents could see the same thing. They see the same thing that we seen. My, my uh, dad said, that is not a bear. And he was so adamant about that bear. He says, well, I was scared when I first seen my first bear, too. Unless we, that's not the first time I've seen a bear. My parents went camping a lot of times. We, we went fishing all the time. We came with cross bear before. And, you know, he was very adamant about that. So he wrote it down in a report that was a bear sighting. And um, he tried to convince us that it was a bear. And after he cast the cast, he uh, walked over through it to smash all the tracks down. That's kind of weird. On, on purpose. Yeah, he he he, he just walked across it, and because, I, like I said, the ground was very soft. It was like it was moss covered and, and very soft on that side of the hill. So when we got back to the house, I, I the way it affected me is I wouldn't even when it got dark outside, I went upstairs. I had put a uh, a, a thick blanket over my window. I did not want to see nothing outside. After dark, I, I I turned radio on and it, to to a volume where if I heard, I didn't want to hear nothing outside, I didn't want to have to look outside, and I lived like that until after my parents decided they were going to relocate back to Virginia, and we left and I lost contact with my friend, and that's basically what happened. The DNR part is fascinating, and, and I've heard them do that kind of stuff before. That guy's probably seen bear uh, tracks all day long, you know, and why cast him? It's bizarre behavior. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you, so when it ran out, you said it was about 20 yards from you? Yes. Can you kind of describe the face? I mean, would you compare it to more of, and you did a pretty good job describing it, but would you compare it more to like a great ape or more to like human? Well, from from the from the bottom of the nose down reminded me of a monkey. I wouldn't know what kind of monkey, but it just it just looked like a monkey. The t from but from the top up, it looked kind of human. It, it the nose in particular, it wasn't it wasn't like a, a monkey's nose where it was just holes in the front of it, but it actually had a, a, a nose like it wasn't like ours. It wasn't pointed, but it was like a flap. And it was wide. So it, it kind of had human characteristics from the, from the nose up. And, and it had long hair. And, uh, except for the cheeks, I remember seeing like gray skin on the cheeks and on the chest. It, it had like bare spots. Did it have canines? No. The, the, the funny thing about that is I, I did notice the teeth were, were square and they were, they were big. They were like, <laughs> they were like four or five times the size of our teeth. They were huge. What do you think set this thing off? Why do you think it came out the way it came out, in your opinion? Um, well, <laughs> I really think that um, we were really naive about the situation. And because <laughs> we didn't know about what they know about today, about the wood knocks, the, 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 the rock throwing. You know, I think we kind of pushed the limit a little bit by yelling at it and screaming at it. And and I, I think it might have been defensive of that. And, or I just think that we were in a place where, you know, he just didn't want people there. And it could have been 
with the wood knocks, I've got to thinking later that maybe there was more than one. And maybe there was a family there. And um, I, I've, I've since researched, and in Greene County, there, there was three um, documented sightings, and they all involved teenagers. And, and this happened around 81 or 82, and they have one documented in that county in 83, 20 miles from where we were. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Like I said, Pennsylvania has a long history of Sasquatch, a long history of it there. Um, and I can't imagine being, you know, 14, 15 years old and having this saying come out and start growling at you. It's almost like you're right. You make one wrong move and you're dead. Yeah. And, and you know, it's affected me in my adult life, too, because now that I'm aware of that and now that I know and, and, with, and it, see it 20 years ago, we didn't have the Internet to just jump on there and check this stuff out. So when I started to get on the Internet and start hearing other people's stories about the wood knocks and the and, and the rock throw and I'm like, oh my goodness, man, we were we were really pushing our luck with this thing. We were really he would basically when they start that kind of behavior, I think they're saying, okay, we're here. You know, now yeah. now it's your it's your move. It's like a warning and almost. It, yeah, it, it they they want their presence known because I, I think that's their warning because I don't think. <laughs> I think they avoid this at all cost, but if they feel like they're being that there's a threat or, or, you know, they're a predator too, I believe, you know, they, you know, they're going to defend their area. And I, I believe that the, the way we were acting now, you know, we, like I said, we were loud, we were playing music. We were, we were screaming at this thing. We were, we thought it was people throwing rocks. I thought maybe somebody followed us in there or heard we were talking about going up there. And, and you know, I didn't even know that we seen a, a Sasquatch or, or, or any, I didn't know. What, I called it a monster. I thought we seen a monster. Yeah, I think most people, they have that reaction and they think it, that it's some sort of monster. I mean, because what, what other box do you put it in? Um, yeah. I think everyone thinks they're going to run into Patty. And the fact is, that's generally not what people see. Yeah, and this thing was nothing like that. I mean, it was nothing like that. What do you think that they are, James? What's your opinion? Well, I, I believe they're flesh and blood, and it, it's an animal, and it's a wild animal. But I also believe it's intelligent, and uh, because I think that I think with our reaction when we when we we broke eye contact with it, I think he was just saying, "Okay, next time is going to be a different story." I think he wanted us to see him, and I think he was protecting something. Did you ever go back to that area after this incident happened? I haven't. I haven't been there since. But I did Google. I did Google map it. Since then, there's been a lot of construction around there, and the, a, a quarry went in around there. And if we would have went another half a mile up, there's a lake out there. Yeah. Well, thank God it didn't didn't try to harm you or hurt you. And there, was there any smell that you that you could notice? You know, I I really couldn't tell you because down there it was uh. It was kind of musky smelling anyway because it was creek water, and so I didn't notice any unusual odor. Yeah, I was just curious. Sometimes people report it. Most of the time they don't. Uh, but, it, you know, it's a terrifying account, James. I would imagine it affects you for most of your life. And it's like I was saying the other day, you know, when um, you, people see this, it turns their world upside down because it's I – I, I think it's so out of the norm – People aren't sure what well, to make of it, you know? Well, hearing other people's the, – the only reason I went ahead today to do this is because it was people's stories like mine that helped me realize that I wasn't singled out, that, that a lot of people were having these experiences, a lot. And a lot of people don't come forward because they're afraid of the ridicule, and they're afraid – I didn't talk about it for a long time because – my closest family looked at me. They, they on my birthday, they made me a birthday cake with a, a foot on it. <laughs> okay, yeah. as a joke, and, and and it was not a joking matter. This was a serious thing to me. <sighs> my parents would have never done that, but my cousins ribbed me about it a lot. You know, and I, even with my kids, I, I've never gave my kids an in depth. This is going to be the first time that my kids are going to ever hear of the whole story. I just told him 
I've seen it. It's not good. If you ever in the woods, you hear this, this, and this, you leave. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. That's good advice. And I'm honored you would come on. I really am that you would take the time to come on and share it. Because, you know, we learn from hearing other people's experiences. You know, like in your encounter, there's a lot of behavior and a lot of, you know, reaction to what you guys are doing. And I think you just learn more from eyewitnesses and, and try and figure out the behavior. And obviously most of it's opinions and everything, but until we have one in a cage, we can study, um, you know, it's, it's nice to hear from eyewitnesses, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh, share it. Thanks again, James. Uh, I'm glad that you have a platform to let people share their stories because I've learned a lot from the other people out here, and I and I appreciate them too for having the courage to to, to give their story because beyond the ridicule and everything, this is the only way we can. Hey, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, Gus. Yeah, I really appreciate you being on, and I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I know you're part of the North American Wood Ape Conservancy Group, and you hold a degree in anthropology from California State, and have worked closely with the Native Americans. Uh, you've even written a book, Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, Bigfoot in Native Culture. And spending all this time with the Native Americans, you know, talking about behavior, descriptions, uh, and kind of working closely with them, uh, what information or what knowledge have the Native Americans shared with you regarding Sasquatch? Well, I mean, that's there's a lot. I mean, mostly it's characteristics that they associate with him. What's his purpose? Because um, all animals, in their opinion, have a purpose. Most tribes believe he's a protector of the forest and that he's somehow related to us he's like a brother but he's not us he's, he's not human in that sense but he's related to us most tribes have a healthy respect and most of them like to just you know keep away from them as at most that they can you know just that's their his berry patch and this is our berry patch don't eat at his berry patch those are for him so it, it's pretty universal in general um, across the United States, but there are some tribes that have a very good relationship, and he's not only a protector of spaces or places, he's a protector for them um, as a tribe. So it can it can vary across, but I've learned a lot. I've been in the field before with tribal members and have something happen, and they tell me, you know, that's related to Yaya Lee, and this is what just happened, and that kind of stuff, and that's always exciting, you know, because that particular item that happened, it wasn't something I had ever experienced before. And so it was kind of like, okay, that, that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm curious, Kathy. Tell us what happened. Well, we were out looking at a meadow because we were talking about uh, doing some restoration to um, plant some native plants back. And one of the tribal members had left his keys on the windshield because, you know, if someone's going to steal your car, you know, just take it don't knock my windows out and all that stuff that goes with that's a pretty common practice uh, around here and we had went in the, the, did quite a long walk came back and his car keys were gone and we looked around everywhere we thought oh maybe you know they fell on the ground somewhere we I mean we looked everywhere and it just so happened that a guy was standing next to a tree and he turned around and looked and the guy's keys were in up on a tree branch in the nook of the tree and he was mad as all get out and he said that yaya lee did that and he's a trickster and all this stuff and he just went off and and i don't have any other explanation for that because there was absolutely we were totally in a remote location we were the only people there we stayed together all the time together nobody left and wandered off or anything and we all returned together at the same time and so you know i don't know that that can was a Bigfoot that did that. We, I certainly didn't notice anything else. We, we looked around to see if we could see any footprints. If somebody had, you know, had wandered into our area, tire tracks, anything like that. We never found anything besides the fact that his keys were up in the tree. It's very strange. Very, very strange. You know, when you talk to a lot of different Native American tribes, some believe it's an animal. Some believe it's the forest brother. Uh, the protector of the woods. Some believe that uh, they'll kill you, you know, they'll kill you and eat you. 
And I know even some of the tribes will say they'll walk in between two worlds. Did you notice that when you were talking with the Native Americans as far as their beliefs? Oh, yeah. Every, all tribes have different beliefs and what they think Bigfoot is. So it's not unusual, but you can find concentrations like in the South. All the stories and belief systems is, is that he's very violent and you want to stay away from him. But in the Pacific Northwest, he's not as violent, even though he steals children, but he's not the kind that, you know, he dismembers people and leaves their bodies for you to find. It's not that, but they will steal children for food resource. And they don't have those kinds of stories like up in the New York area. So it's every area is kind of different. And I think it's, it's based maybe on different personalities of a Bigfoot, I guess. I mean, you're always going to have a rotten apple and even in humans. So it wouldn't surprise me that individual Bigfoots have different behaviors or different um, characteristics that make them more or less scary to the tribe. So it's it's hard to know. A few years ago, I guess more somewhere like 10 now, I've been here 20 something years. I used to have to go out to the reservation at night because we were having meetings and talking about certain things and we could only do it at night because we needed the elders there. And they had been having trouble with uh, a Bigfoot on the reservation and they had already told me, you know, if you hear a whistle while you're here, do not go outside, stay where you're at and we'll take care of it. And one night they had to escort me to my car because there had been so much activity that particular day, they were concerned for my safety. And so that's actually a real life experience with um, a tribe being fearful for, for people's lives. Yeah, that is. And one of the other questions I wanted to ask you, you know, when you're working with uh, the different tribes, have they ever talked to you about skinwalkers? And do you have an understanding of what the skinwalker is? Obviously, it's not Bigfoot related, but I'm just curious because you spent so much time working with the Native Americans. Uh, no, I, I really didn't because um, it's hard enough getting your head wrapped around what their beliefs in Bigfoot is. And so, you know, I've heard of them before they were brought up and I just didn't want to do a deep dive on it. There's this other thing called a water baby, which is um, more Californian, uh, West Coast kind of thing. And I, I've heard it mentioned before, but I never pursued it just because I got enough going on in my head. I, I don't need any more, yeah. any more things in there. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I've heard of them and they tried to tell me stories, but it just wasn't something that I wanted to focus on. Yeah, I understand. I understand completely. I think most Native Americans don't want to focus on skinwalkers. A lot of times no, if you ask them, they don't, want, awful. Yeah, they don't want to talk about it. Uh, if you would, I know you've had a few sightings. Would you take the audience back on your first sighting, kind of tell us what you were doing and, and just what happened? Sure. I have been friends with people that are in the NAW, um, AC. Did I say that right? North American Wood. Uh, okay. <laughs> you sound, did, did you sound, like, you sound like me when I say it. I know. I was like, where? What's the initial um, I, I, You know, so like Daryl Collier and, of course, uh, Alton Higgins. And they had approached me when I was giving, uh, I think, my last talk in Texas. They said, you know, Kathy, we'd really, really like you to, or maybe it was before that. I don't remember exactly when. But they said, you know, there's all this stuff going on. Uh, at this place we call Area X. And we sure would like to invite you down to see it for yourself and see what you think. And, and I said, well, you know, I think I'm interested in that. We can use it as a opportunity to run through Texas and see some of our family and, and then go on to Oklahoma and, and just stay a week, you know, no, no big long time and see what happens. And so uh, Bob and I drove out there. A really nice trip too. It was just beautiful country. I believe we arrived on a Sunday, and this gives me if I'm getting my days wrong, but it was in t May of 2012. And it was a really quiet um, day, nothing exciting. So the next morning, I really wasn't expecting uh, much else. But essentially, I would say my life changed um, that day, that everything I'd ever wanted, you know, having my own sighting was was happening. And, and I, I don't think I took it very well. But and essentially, we have been, uh, there's cabins there. And something had been throwing rocks onto the tin roof, and it just makes this horrible sound. And so basically they were playing ping pong between going, running over to this cabin, running back over here, running to that cabin, running back over here. I was entertained by it at least. I, you know, it has to be something 
causing that kind of thing. And this place is very, very remote. The, when we first started down the road to this place, I was like, yeah, this isn't so bad. This is no different than a forest service road that I drive on all the time. And then it got horrible. I thought, oh my God, we're never going to get out of here. We're going to die down here because it just, it was the worst road I've ever been on in my life, but we made it. And so I instinctively knew there's not anybody else here. It's just us because we would hear your car. We'd see you. There's just no way for you to hide from us. And so I thought, well, this is pretty exciting. You know, there's something going on and, and, you know, okay. So after the last rock throw, uh, there was all five of us um, that were there. We came back and we were sitting down and it was a pretty warm day and it was still daylight. Uh, one of the gentlemen, Mark, say, well, I hear some something walking and, and we stopped and we talking we stopped talking and started listening and we could hear it and i'm looking right down this place is called the bottleneck i'm i'm facing it because i'm sitting in the, the uh, chair that's looking right down it and then there they are there's two of them uh, a big one and a and a small one i i have always said i have no proof for it it's just my initial instinct that it was a older sister caring for her younger rotten sibling and they're coming right at us. And I stood up and I go, there they are. And I pointed at them and then I ran at them. And had I waited just maybe a few more seconds that we had a camera there and I'm the one who triggered it when I went past it. And so we did not get them on film. But after I ran at them, they bolted up this hillside like nothing I have ever seen in my life. It was so fast because they were somewhat loud coming towards us because I don't think they knew we were there. And But the way they moved up that hillside was seamless and quiet and elegant. And it was like they had been on a bungee and, and the bungee went boop and popped them right up, right up the hill. And I remember thinking to myself, if I was a ghost hunter, I would have just thought I saw two ghosts. They were so fast and, and graceful of what they did. So of the five of us, four of us all saw it. So the the fifth guy was looking in the wrong direction. I don't know what he was looking at, but he didn't get to see any of it. And then the, the just the whole rest of that week was just um mind blowing. It was just just rock after rock after rock. I heard some mumbling. We had um, a something bluff rushes. Um, we had just all kinds of stuff happening, and so it was just. It was a, the trip of a lifetime for sure. And and to be fair, I literally had a meltdown immediately afterwards because it finally not only was everything I believed actually they're right there before my eyes, but their speed and their size startled me so badly. I was I just turned around to Bob and I said, we can't win this. We, we just let's just go home. We can't win this. And he's like, what, what do you mean? And and I'm just falling apart. You know, I was just like, if they wanted to, they could have grabbed me and took me up that hillside and nobody could have done a thing about it because th they just would have outpowered them, outran, you know, and it was just it was an overwhelming feeling um, at that moment. So I bet anyway, yeah. that, that's my story. <laughs> especially after all the years of studying with the natives and what made you run towards it? I was going to get them. I don't know. I <laughs> get to tackle them. Get, get some hair. I, I, I don't know. It was just my instinct of, of, I got to get closer. I, you know, I don't know. It was just my instinct to, to do that. And, um, you know, now I, it, had I thought it through, had it been more competent, but you know, my first one, I should have, I think they were heading to try to get behind a shed that was there. Cause that's what it looked like that's what they were heading, they, but they probably would have ran anyway once they realized we were there. So I don't think me running at them would have made any difference other than they could have triggered that camera that, that um, it, had they passed and we would have at least gotten something, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah, and I'm not giving you a hard time. It's exciting. You know, people get excited when they – either people freak out or um, – I've actually heard of hunters doing what you did. And I'm like, what Why? What made you chase them? You know, and, and I think it's just our brains kind of get – even though you've known about the subject, you've read about it, you've heard about it, you've uh, – you know, and then – but seeing is believing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's pretty powerful that it was two. They looked exactly like Patty from the Patterson-Gimlin film. I, I just couldn't hardly believe that it was their speed and their size was just 
oh, sh you know, they're they're not kidding when they say that. You know, we used to hear those those reports of people saying they were driving and and the Bigfoot was running with the car or chasing the car. And I used to go, sure, you know, and now I'm going, well, maybe that did happen because they're pretty darn fast. And they're agile in the sense that, you know, that hillside w is really steep. You know, I had really only been up there a couple times because it was, uh, you know, didn't feel very good trying to get up there. And they did it with no problems whatsoever. It was it was like they were on downhill, you know, as fast as they were going. Plus, with all the green briar and the rocks and stickers and snakes and everything else that's around there. So, you know, they're definitely amazing creatures. Yeah, it almost seems unnatural how fast that they can be, you know, when they want to be. Um, have all of your sightings taken place there out in Area X? Yes, yes. And the next year, in 2013, um, I saw, uh, I thought it was a baby chimp in the tree, and it was on the end of a um, branch or a limb, and it was jumping over to another limb. And I said, oh, yeah, I've seen that before in the zoo, you know. And then I went, Kathy, there's no baby chimps out here. And then I went, ah. And I, so we ran towards it, tried to find it again, and I didn't find it because it had obviously already moved on. And it was, you know, pretty small. And uh, later on that week, I believe one of our other um, team members saw it again. And so, and we other people in that area have since seen um, more than a few babies there, which would make sense. I mean, in order to have a, you know, population, you'd have to have Bigfoots at every age that there is. So, um, you know, that, that wouldn't surprise me. It was just like, where's your mom? You know, and then I got to think, well, mom's got to be somewhere near here. We didn't, we didn't hear or say anything else. How far away from you was this thing up in the tree? Oh, it was pretty high up in the tree, but I was sitting on a porch and the, the only shade there was at the time. And um, so I was up above everybody else. And I would say it was like um, maybe 40 yards at the most. I mean, it was, but it was good up in the, in the tree. And I only noticed because of the movement, you know, that there was something large in larger than a squirrel in a tree and that it was out there on that limb and that it was going to jump over. And I said, you know, it, it looked exactly like what you would think a baby chimp would look like. You know, she just it didn't have a tail. It was it was had a nice flat back. It's hairy all over the same color that the, the two I'd seen the year before, dark brown, just moved with grace like that was some way it traveled all the time. Yeah, I've had a lot of witnesses talk about them being in trees. I've had a lot. And the part that, um, you know, and so I think for a lot of people who go out there and look for this thing, they're always looking down at the ground, you know, for tracks or whatever. Um, but I think it's more important to look in the trees because I've had so many eyewitnesses, even large ones in trees, you know, where they, they'll be out there, coon hunters will be out there in the middle of the night. Then it sounds like an elephant dropped out of the tree and landed on the ground and took off running. Um, so I think even oh, yeah. the the bigger ones get up in trees. Oh, yeah. I had um, not in – I wasn't a sighting, but I had a very unusual experience um, in California here. Uh, I was doing a, an archaeology project in the forest, and I had something approach my tent at night. We had camped out there with a bunch of volunteers, and we're doing a recording um, aspen carvings. Uh, so we were camping, and uh, all my archaeologists were there. And uh, I heard something approach my tent and I had yelled at it, you know, is that you, Lisa? Is you, what are you doing? Kind of thing. And then it reached and touched my tent and but went from like like you're trying to unzip a zipper, but it went from the top down to the bottom. And I was like, oh, man, now now this is on. So I got out of my tent and jumped over to catch it. You know, it was late at night. Man, it was been about like two in the morning. And I went, ha, like this to catch it, because I just assumed it was one of my archaeologists, you know, and there was nothing there. And so I ran over to the other side of the tent, and I said, ha, ha, I got you caught, and there's nothing there. And I went, okay, well, maybe I just imagined that, you know, oh, well, wait, you know, whatever. It's my archaeologist, Steve, I'll kill him in the morning, you know. And so I got I got back into my tent, zipped it down, got into my sleeping bag, and was just about ready to zip it up when something went bam, right to right next to the tent, next to my head. And I realized it had been in the tree, whatever it was. And so I was like, now I'm scared. Now I'm not willing to get it back out because I didn't know what I was dealing with. And then I heard it walk off 
um, up up some granite because I could hear the the smaller pieces of granite dislodge and, and pebble off. And so um, and then anyway, other things happened that particular week um, to one one thing each for each archaeologist that had some very strange things that happened like um, but I don't necessarily want to go into that but yeah, I hear you. That that still is terrifying. You get out and you realize it was up in the tr- up in the tree. I think that they do. I yeah. think if the tree's big enough and it will hold them, they'll climb up it. Even a big one will. Um, and that's my opinion, of course. But um, it w- tell me about your last sighting. Yeah, that would have been in 2014. It's interesting because the rim fire, one of the largest fires in California, not anymore, but at the time happened in 2013, and I had been to X. And that year, the, the the year of the baby, I was there for three weeks um, without Bob. So because he went for three weeks without me so that somebody could be home for the kids. And so um, and that was right before the rim fire. And so I remember in 2014, I just said, there's just no way we're going to be able to go because, you know, I'm just still re- we're still working on this fire, recovering, trying to help the arc sites. And Bob just said, no, let, let's take this time to just go ahead and go and, and revive ourselves because it had been such a long, hard year. So we went and I'm standing on the porch, um, had just gotten up. Everybody else was outside already and, you know, talking about what they're going to have for breakfast. And because I'm standing on the porch, I have a direct line of sight over through these. There's a few places on this property where you can walk. It's, it's got enough clearance or you can see through, but not many. So I'm standing on the porch and and looking across um, the property, and all of a sudden I see a very large gray Bigfoot. And so I saw him from about, it would be his chest at his neck and down to, um, I I would say, maybe the knees, something like that. And I saw him walk by. So I saw his arm, and he's humongous. I mean, but really great, just like a gray person would be. And not not white, but the gray. And so um, I, I said, hey, there, there goes one. And they all turned around and looked, and about five people ran that directions toward it. And they found where it had, had been were laying and then how it walked down to the creek. And as they had gone over there, it had picked up pace and just took off. And so in a reenactment, I, I stayed put where I was, so I would not change my point of view. And I told Bob to go over there and stand in that location, and Bob looked like a little tiny butterfly <laughs> compared to to that guy. And we still we took a picture of it at the distance of uh, what he looked like. He didn't even even remotely. He was like a third of that opening. And this a- animal had been this uh, the, at least two thirds t- bigger than him. And Bob is six foot tall, so he he had to have been gigantic. So do you think and we, he's and he's been seen before? We call him Old Gray. So. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, do you think he was sleeping and then stood up and you just saw him standing there? Do you think he was? No, I I have, again, no evidence for this whatsoever. I think he was our our night watchman. He was in charge of making sure we, we didn't do anything stupid. And once I had gotten up, for some reason, he thought all of us were present. And so now he could leave and let the next person come in. And I, there, like I said, there's no evidence for that. It's just something in my head, what I thought maybe what was going on or because I don't, it, he had definitely had been laying down because we had found the the location where it was all matted down in the exact location where he was. So, but I just don't see that it was too close to us for him to have been sleeping there. That would have been stupid in my mind for something that large. He's obviously very intelligent and I don't see any reason for him to have been in that area except for taking um, a look at us. One question I want to ask you, um, what makes you think that they have night watchmen? And again, I, I know it's opinions and theories and impressions, but those are important too. You know, I, whenever I interview eyewitnesses, um, I'll ask them, what was your impression as far as what was going on? And a lot of times they're dead on with what I think too is what what they said happened. You can kind of match up some of the behavior, but I, I'm just curious, what gives you that impression that they have uh, night watchmen? Um, it, it is something that Native Americans have conveyed to me for um, in, in many tribes and many locations. But I think it's also just the general feeling that we had is that we were constantly being watched. I can't even go into all of it, but just whenever we 
potentially we're too close to one, something would always happen to lead us away from that location. So, you know, it was it was a constant, like something was always there, making sure we didn't get to a certain place or get something trapped or something to that effect. And it just always felt, if you'll read um, the monograph that's on the website, it, it kind of details some of those things about where we thought we had a Bigfoot pinned down over here and then something would always happen behind us or to get us over to the, this other direction. So whatever was over that we thought we had pinned could get away. And that can only happen, in my opinion, if you have, you're being watched at constant timing. And we also had a lot of weird things happen, like at, at when somebody new was coming in to relieve a team member or we had a new vehicle coming in, almost always there was a wood knock uh, announcing that to somebody that somebody was coming. And so it was, it was like clockwork. I got you. No, I know a lot of uh, natives say that. And even a lot of people, have, they have that same opinion and impression. I was just kind of curious on your thoughts on that. I don't believe they do it when, when people are not there. I think they only do it when people are there. Kind of keep an eye on the other predators. Yeah, and just I, I think they don't know what we're doing there for. You know, why are you guys here and what are you up to? And uh, we better watch you just in case you you go someplace you shouldn't or you're doing something we don't want you to be doing or something to that effect. You know, and I was just kind of curious if other primates do that. I mean, I know humans do that. There's tribes in Africa um, and they have watchmen so that tiger doesn't come in and kill everyone. But non-human primates, I wonder if they exhibit that same type of behavior where someone's kind of watching over the tribe. I, I believe that, that gorillas are known to do that, and I believe chimps are also known to do, to do that. The, a male is, is signed to make sure nothing creeps up on them that they are not aware of, and then they alarm to let the rest of the troop know, and then they head up into the trees for safety. And so I think that, yeah, it's a, it's a natural, we're primates as well, so it's a, I think a primate instinct to want to protect your, your group, including probably pregnant females and very small ones that can't defend themselves. And so I, I would think that's natural. And it wouldn't surprise me that at certain times that, I, I mean, for me, I guess, Old Gray being the largest, I would assume because of his coloring that he's the alpha. And why in particular the alpha would bother taking care of us suggests that there was something important or something happening or something that the, that the head had to be there, not, not one of the more or less inexperienced um, animals that are in that group. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I want to come back to Bigfoot, but I want to ask you real quick, what's the coolest thing you ever found while doing archaeology, even the, the strangest or even the coolest thing that maybe on a dig or what's something that kind of stands yeah. out to you? We uh, there there's there's um, more than a few. The the rim fire was also one of those life changing events. Um, it burned uh, a significant part of our forest, and for the first time, we we commonly joke that one of our districts is the Groveland Ranger District, and we joke about that place having old growth um, poison oak because you always get poison oak when you go there because it's just everywhere. So this fire, though, you know, it consumed absolutely everything. It was down, down to ash. And so that gave us the opportunity to um, do some surveys with actual being able to see everything on the ground. And so we found some amazing things um, out there. And, and I didn't particularly find it. They, another group found it, but I went back to the site. But we found at a place the tribe had told us was one of their um, – traditional hunting grounds and we found a soapstone we also call it steatite bowl about the size of so I, it, you know it's like a doll sized one so it's really super tiny that they would crush ochre in and then use it for their hunting both on their body to disguise their bodies and on decoration for their uh, bows and arrows and I had never seen one before and so it was just exciting and when I, I told the tribe and showed it to them they they were knew exactly what it was and they asked me is this where it was found and I said yeah and they go oh, yeah that's that's our traditional hunting area so that um, doesn't surprise me at all and so I I found that to be just spectacular and and I guess one of the other cool things that that I personally found was this really cool um, craft mayonnaise lid 
for that had Bing Crosby on it advertising his radio show. And it was as beautiful colors you could imagine. And it didn't look like the fire had harmed it at all. And I remember I was with uh, three other archaeologists and only one other of them knew who Bing Crosby was. The other two were too young. They were like, who? I was like, all right, that, that, I, I'm not having it now. <laughs> it, it, was just, it was just too much. But it was that. That was one of the cool because it just, it just looked like it was somebody had just thrown it down yesterday. It was just amazing. Yeah, it's like going back in time, finding stuff like that. Yeah, and we also had, just uh, because it's related to Native Americans, we had one of the coolest sites I had ever been to. We had collected about 100 arrowheads off of it, or projectile points, if we call it, of every size, shape, color, material uh, you could imagine. In one of my other arts, we had all noticed these weird little round balls. They look like like marbles, um, but they were made of stone, and they're all over this site. And I, I was like, well, maybe we should have collect a couple of these and and ask them what they're doing. And so I had been to this other tribal event and I took them out and I showed it to them. And I said, we've, this site is just covered with these things. And they go, Oh my God, take those back. And I said, well, why? And they go, because those are, they call them shaman stones and they're meant to keep that site from being discovered. It's an important place for that tribe to be going. And so that it's a ritual that you put that site to bed, hide it, with these shaman rocks. And so I'm like, okay. And so I was like, well, we're going to have to go take these back. And, um, and we did, we did, but it was, um, I never would have known that if I hadn't shown it to the, the elders of a tribe, because I didn't have any idea what they were. That's really cool. So they, so we put some around, uh, as to remember the place or you said to keep people no, away. It, yes. To keep white people away. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> because the site was really important. And for it to have that many projectile points. And and the, the funny part about all of this is uh, two years before that, um, I had taken some student archaeologists to this location. And we attempted to get to this site, but you couldn't get to it because the brush was so thick. You couldn't see any of it at all. I mean, we couldn't even push through the brush. And it, that's exactly how it looks like now, uh, right? It, it, it recovered. A lot of places on the forest are still recovering. They don't have any brush, grass, anything growing back yet. And this was one of the first places that recovered. It, it was covered in brush within a year. And what did the Native Americans do? So let's say you go out to a site and you, you find stuff like this. Uh, what do the mm -hmm. Natives do with it? Do they put it in some sort of Museum? Do they? Does it go to the tribal elders? No, it stays with the U.S. Forest Service because um, sites are considered federal lands, and these are federal artifacts. And so, and the reason I collected them because we don't normally have a collection policy um, was because it's so open. Anybody coming to this area would have what we call pot hunted. It, they would have stolen the artifacts. And so I took them, we GPS where we get them from, we catalog them, and then we, we store them until such time as we can safely put them back, you know, or we learn from them or whatever we need to do. But yeah, they belong in federal custody until such time as we return them and to the, the site. Oh, so they return them to the site, Did, but the feds don't give them to the tribe and, or then in no. turn turn it over to the tribe? No, no. The only things that like that that, we turn over our things like human remains, funeral objects, things like that are things of cultural patrimony. Um, as a, it's a law called NAGPRA that we um, have to um, uh, follow, but we don't, none of these items fall under that. I have a very strong list of what those items are and none of, we don't touch those things. I gotcha. Going back to Bigfoot, out there at Area X, so you've been out there for almost 10 years, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, we didn't get to go this past year in 2019 because um, I hurt my knee and plus I had did, did, yeah, did a detail for the regional office in Vallejo. And so there just wasn't any time in the summer to go. Um, but, yeah, we, we've been going since 2012 and the group itself had been going to that area much longer because they did a um, – uh, a camera set up prior to that. And so they, they've been going to that area for, I don't even know, maybe 15 years, probably longer. I don't remember the exact date. They started the, uh, all summer operations, I believe in 2011, where we put group after group after group after group, starting, you know, May to at least September, constantly occupying the, the, the location. 
since at least 2011. I got you. A long time. Over that time, what what have you taken away or what have you learned, you know, from Kathy showing up day one and Kathy being out there now over that time period? Um, has there been surprises or has there been anything to where you thought, oh, that's why they do that? Um, anything new that um, you've learned? Well, I've learned a lot since uh, that first trip. I mean, there was definitely things that I had heard people say witnesses report and, and personally got to witness that exact same thing. I think uh, the greatest lesson I've learned is that there are extraordinarily curious about us. Like, why are we here? Why are you still here? Um, what's your purpose? Why don't you have any hair in your body? You know, why do you guys do the things you do? And they, I like I said, they did, they're constantly watching us. And, and we, I think that's a universal feeling throughout the group that they're they're always there somewhere at at any given time, and you have to uh, just be diligent all the time because you don't know when you're going to run into one of them. And so, um, if you, if people are interested, the monograph that's on the website it gives uh, details for some of the most important things that we've noticed during uh, our time there. It hasn't been updated, but we do keep an up we do keep a record of events that happen, where they happen, um, time of year, uh, weather conditions, those types of things, so we can start seeing patterns. And I think the the most fascinating thing, I think, was the TAG-7 paper, if you ever get a chance to read that. It was fascinating. We were able to put a sensor on a Bigfoot because we had it up you know, in a in a branch at a height that a normal animal would not have had it stuck to them. It was in a burr. And so, you know, kind of like um, a cockaburr. And so the, the device was embedded in that. And so when it hit the animal's fur, it, it gets tangled up into it and then would be able to be tracked using um, using these these devices. I'm not as good as a, in, this stupid device never worked for me, but um we were able to track where we got those pings of where it went. And so there's a tag seven paper that discusses the seasonality. We could see at different times of months and seasons, they were, that tag was moving to different places in order to uh, exploit the resources that are available in that Valley. And so it's, it's a very unique, didn't surprise me in the sense of that's how I would think any animal would move that, you know, Native Americans did that when the resource was only good or only found in this location in May. That's where I'm at in May. This other resource that I need is only found way over there in June. So that's where I'm going to be in June. That's how people move throughout the environment. So it wouldn't surprise me that Bigfoot would do exactly the same. Yeah. And I'll put up a link for that. You said it's called Tag 7? Yeah, Tag 7. It's also on the website. I can I can send you the links for that. Yeah, please do. Um, how long does that that uh, sensor? How long does that last? And how long did you track this thing for? Oh well, that's uh, Bob's the one that usually handles those questions because I haven't um, can't remember. It, months it lasts for months, and um, I believe we we were able to track it for a significant period of time. I mean, it was months that we were able to pinpoint where they were at that time. And we have a couple of pilots in um, our group, and they were able to to find the pings by using airplanes and flying over the area and getting, uh, getting the signal that way as well. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's well worth reading just to, uh, and it's not necessarily that we're looking for people to go, you know, wow, that's really monumental. That proves Bigfoot's real. It's more of here's a technique you can also use um, in your research that might, you might find useful. Yeah, it's very useful. I can't wait to read that. Tag 7, I'm going to look that up. Um, you know, one of the things in the Bigfoot world is, uh, and I, I try and stay out of that whole community um, for obvious reasons, but, you know, they, they'll, they, they freak out. I get hate mail when I talk about, because I think one should be shot. And not it's not a, a hate thing. It's not that I want them dead. Um, it's that once you shoot one and bring it in, you you can prove it at that point. In my opinion, yes. you'll never prove it with blood samples, hair samples, audio, video. All that stuff is fascinating, but it's not going to prove anything. 
You can take all the, and you know, you hear Bigfoot researchers say, oh, if I can get crystal clear HD footage, it's not going to, you're going to get eaten alive if you post that. It's not going to prove anything. Um, but a body yeah. will prove it. And, you know, a lot of people right. get upset with the thought of killing one. I've had several hunters on the show that have wounded them, shooting at them. Because they're terrified. They don't know what they just ran into. So I, I'm on the opposite side of the coin. I'm kind of with the, your guys' group. I've always hoped that, you know, I get a, <laughs> I had show up on Google that you guys had finally done it. Um, what's kind of that process look like out there as far as shooting one? And then what do you do after you shoot one? What's kind of the next procedure? What, what do we do next? Um, well, you know, we're pro science. And so, um, we, and I have wanted to maybe change the, those narratives of kill, no kill kind of thing. It's more of pro-science or pro-pseudoscience. You know, I have a very strong feeling that people put Disneyland characters on Bigfoot, like he's some big fluffy bunny rabbit, and he's our forest friend and all that other crap. And it bugs me to any extent possible. They're not your friend. They're not a big, fuzzy, loving furball kind of thing. And our goal is science requires a body so that they can place its genus species in that tree of our kingdom to know exactly what they are, what they're capable of. Can they talk? Because you'll be able to analyze the vocal cords, all that stuff that goes with that. Our intent is to save the species as a whole because as we continue to, to go down the road of cutting down trees and all that other stuff that goes with it, they're losing their environment. And so to lose one to save the whole is worth it. And because I would be greatly saddened if this species went away, if 20 years from now we're not studying them in uh, a scientific method in the classroom, get people getting degrees, or if they're reading about them in the extinct a book because we did nothing, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, we do have very strong protocols in in place because I would hazard to guess that if we were um, successful in killing one, that there's probably going to be another one, someone nearby. So you need to know your protocols. What do we do in, in this scenario? Here's what you're going to do. Here's who you call. This is how we preserve it. This is how we do this. This is how we do this. And then our goal is to give it to science. It's We will never, ever, ever make a dime off of it. It's not our interest to do that. We want science to have it so that the announcement can be made that at least in Oklahoma, although if Oklahoma has it, you know darn well California, Oregon, Washington, Vancouver, blah, 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 all have it, right? They're here in Oklahoma. We're going to preserve the species from this day on. They're protected. Uh, the government's going to pay for uh, science to be done so that we can know exactly what they need in their habitat. And that's the road that it goes down, the Endangered Species Act. And I, and I would hope people would look at it like that, that they stop personalizing that this one Bigfoot is somehow so special that we shouldn't be doing anything. Well, you're dooming the whole species when you have that attitude. I couldn't agree more. So kind of pass it off to science once you guys have killed it. Yes. Yeah. I, and we have goals in no case we can't get the whole thing, you know, but you know, you're, you're getting the most important parts, safeguarding the rest of it until we can get a larger party or, you know, cranes, not a crane, but a winch out there to, cause I suspect they weigh quite a bit. Yeah. You'd probably have to cut it up. As, as gross as yeah. that sounds. Um, but I, I do wish you guys luck, and I, and I don't think it's a bad thing to kill one. You know, Grover said that for years, that one should be shot. Yeah. And uh, I, yeah. I think he was right. You know, I think he was, a, you know, could, how many more audio recordings are we going to listen to? How many more track casts are we going to look at? How many more, you know, it's like the same old, same old time and time again. And I think the only way to actually open the door is, is to kill one. Um, yeah, and we already have, Fabulous footage in the Patterson Gimlin film, and that's still not good enough because some Yahoo's going to come up and say, "Oh no, that was me in the suit." Blah blah blah, and you'll go, "Well, show me the suit." They show you the suit, and there's no way that's them. But you know, but then you put a little seed of doubt in somebody's brain. Now, now it's not proof anymore. And so the only thing you can't fake, or someone claims they faked, is a body. Why do you think after ten years it's been so hard to kill one? 
I think because most of our sightings are seconds long. And so by the time you get the, the gun prepared to shoot, it's gone. You know, we, we believe we have wounded one before in, in the past, uh, the echo event. Um, and, you know, it, it happens. You have to have the time, the opportunity, and it has to be there at the right time with the right person. And so um, I know that I, I always carry a gun. I have a 357, and there's no way my gun would have done anything to those two that I saw the first year. It, would, they, it wouldn't have stunned them at all. They would have just kept on running. And so, and I, I sort of would hate to have that happen where you shoot and wound one and then it die somewhere else for no reason. So um, you have to have the proper re- weapon and the right opportunity and the time and length. So out of all the years that you've been down there at area X, what, what would you say is the top three best evidence out of all these years that the group has to offer that if someone came along and, um, what would be the best evidence you would, you would present to them? Um, I think the, the diversity of the people who have had, um, eyewitness accounts. I mean, we have, uh, we have other anthropologists in our group. We have doctors, we have pilots, we have all kinds of professional military people that have had sightings down there. And I, I think that is credible because we're so diverse. We have lots of sightings where there are multiple people who saw the same thing at the same time. For me, I'm, I work for the federal government. I have a master's degree. I'm well regarded in my profession. Why would I want to lie about it? I mean, that didn't do me any good whatsoever. And I think uh, we have a lot of recordings as well that that describe the rock throwing, the thing we call the the rain of rocks, which we still don't really understand. But the diversity of the grunts, the whistles, the that gibberish thing like what you hear on the Sierra sounds, I think that's very valuable because it shows a lot of diversity in what they're capable of in one spot and it and it supports the Sierra sounds. And I know that we had a, a blood sample. We still have yet to have anything come of that. I think that's good evidence. But I, I think tag seven is probably the number one thing. I think it's unique what we were able to accomplish with that. I think it aids um, our knowledge um, about what they're capable of. And I think it introduces a new technique that if we could deploy it on a larger scale throughout the United States, at one point it's going to be successful and land us um, being able to pinpoint where one is at one time where we can be there already in order to get uh, this, the body that we need. I hear you. Yeah, it's um, I, I really do wish you guys luck out there. I really do. I hope you guys well, you. are successful out there. And um, I know it's odd in the Bigfoot world to have someone wish you success, but uh, <laughs> I do oh, wish no, usually... I do wish you guys success. I, I... It would be the greatest day of my life if you guys shot one tomorrow and it was over with. You know what I mean? I know. I, I, there's a lot of people I go, huh? huh yeah, no. But yeah, no, I have never. Um, I don't think I've ever been in a on a show or in a position where somebody was upset with our position. I mean, I've been in Bigfooting a long time. I had this belief when I first started. I, I've always been pro science and pro body. And so um, if somebody knows me and wants to talk to me, they should be aware of that position. And so I've never had anybody that I know of not wish a success or say something like, oh, well, I hope Bigfoot gets you guys first or anything like that. So um, I think in general, um, I think the NAWAC is well respected in what we're trying to achieve. So, yeah, I think when they have people like you in the group, it's hard not to respect what you guys are doing because uh, you are professional. And so, uh, why wouldn't the group be held up? You know, it, if someone just told me there's a bunch of Bigfoot researchers out in the woods with guns trying to kill Sasquatch, uh, I'd be a little nervous. I told Matt Pruitt, a lot of people in the Bigfoot world, I wouldn't trust to make me a sandwich, let alone hand everyone a gun. <laughs> And uh, run out around out there to shoot one. But, you know, and I know there's procedures in place and Matt kind of went over that. Um, and so it is safe. I mean, it's you almost want someone who doesn't really want that's more cautious before they pull a trigger as opposed to someone who's trigger happy because uh, that yes. can end in disaster really quick. Yes. And and, and plus, I think um, there's people out there who want to shoot one in order to make a million dollars or whatever they think that they're going to get from that. And that's 
that disgusts me because you, you shouldn't kill anything. I, well, it's just my personal beliefs. I would only shoot an animal for food. I don't shoot an animal to sell a body part of it. And, or it's for science because I want the species to be that, to, to continue on. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of people out there that have belief systems that I definitely do not agree with. And those are people that shouldn't have a gun and be doing that because that's that's when accidents happen. And we're always very careful. We have protocols of when and where you can take a shot. You have to have a hunting license. You've got to um, have the right gun. You know, it's all laid out strictly and you have to follow the protocols. And people who break those protocols, we kick you out of the group because we don't allow that. We don't allow people being irresponsible. We don't, we just don't, you're, you're gone. We don't give you a second chance. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. You know, one question I ask everyone, Kathy, and there's no wrong answer because no one truly knows. Uh, but what do you think that Sasquatch is? What's your opinion? Oh, I, I think they're a primate. I think they're probably um, closely related to orangutans. Very likely could be Diopithecus. Um, I don't know for sure, but, you know, a, a primate is no problem with me whatsoever to to say that. So they're they're in that line somewhere. Um, how close to any of those do do we really know? Well, that's what you need the body for. And, and we had an interesting discussion the other day that Bob and I were talking about the coronavirus and the potential for this animal to get that, you know, because we now know that some animals have can contracted it and that would even be more horrible if they got wiped out by this by this but we won't know those things unless until we can study their dna and where they fall um in relation to those things and that is even a better reason why we need a body is to protect them from outbreaks like this you know what what's the chances of us going to x this year that we contaminate the area for that population and that's something I wish we knew in advance, but we don't know. And and we are taking precautions for that because we don't want that to happen. But, you know, it, it's very likely to me that that's, they're in the primate line somewhere. They're not human. I'm very sure of that. I've seen no evidence that they can do anything related to culture. They don't have fire. They don't make tools. They don't do any of that stuff. And so I'm not worried about you know, making that argument that there's somehow some homo species that we're unaware with there that I would say they're, if anything, Meldrum's close to right with, with the Gyopithecus um, hypothesis. Yeah, that's one of those fun questions I like to ask everyone because there's really no wrong answer. Uh, definitely check out Kathy's book, Kathy Strain, author of Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, uh, Bigfoot in Native Culture. And I'll throw a link underneath this episode if you want to go to Amazon and get yourself a copy of it. Uh, Kathy, I really enjoyed having you on. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.
Save me from myself, let me try 